We already went over the early life of Sam Houston in this video linked here, so let's go over the next few years. Let's start where we left off with Sam. It's the end of Sam's first term as president of Texas. A rule in the Texas Constitution stipulates that a president cannot run for consecutive terms. So Samuel Houston is forced to stand by while his former vice president takes the presidency in a landslide election. Houston knows that his former VP, Maribel Bonaparte Lamar, will force away almost all of this hard work that he had accomplished in his presidency. So Samuel Houston makes sure to leave him a little something in his farewell address. Sam then goes on a three hour long speech, invigorating the crowd and absolutely stunning the new president. Maribel is left so speechless by Sam's speech that he doesn't even get up to talk at his own inaugural address that followed Sam Houston's farewell address. If it wasn't for the rule that was in the constitution, Houston probably would have ran for his second term and won right away. While Houston retired from the role of president, he remained restless. In 1839, Sam founded a new law practice, this time in Texas. He was also a founding member of the Sabine City Land Development Company, where he and the owners tried to build up Sabine City from a town to a true city. In 1839, only a year after his two-year stint as president, Houston would run for another Texan government seat. This time, he ran for the House of Representatives for San Augustine County, easily winning this election. Houston spent the rest of his time watching the ticking clock that would eventually see the end of Maribu Lamar's disastrous presidency. Houston was not a fan of most of the things that Lamar stood for. Maribel Lamar even started what can only be described as a genocide against the Native Americans that Sam Houston had always had a soft spot for. After defeating David G. Burnett by 4,000 votes, Sam was handed back the country that he had helped to found and seen delve into around $7 million of debt under President Lamar. Sam Houston reenacted many of the same policies that he had once had in his first term. This included friendly relations with the Native Americans, cutting government expenses, especially in the military, as well as trying to get the USA to annex Texas. For his Secretary of State, Sam chose a man that was very much like himself in political thinking. His name was Anson Jones, and he will become very important in a few years. Upon becoming president, Houston almost immediately set up a meeting between him and the Native American tribes in Texas. This meeting re-established good relations, and the result would promote free trade and coexistence with the natives, much to the dislike of many Texans. One expense that Houston could easily cut out of the equation of Texan finance was the newly built navy that Lamar had funded. The newly employed sailors did not want to lose their boats because they wanted to keep their job, so they did something quite comical to avoid the disbanding of their ship. The crew, under Captain Edwin Moore, decided to stay at sea so President Houston could never disband them. Houston wasn't a person that you wanted to avoid, as Edwin Moore and the rest of his crew were all declared as pirates. Not wanting to be a fugitive on the open sea, the crew decided to return to their Texan harbor at Galveston. President Sam arrived to disband the ships, but the people of Galveston rejected this. They saw how much Edwin Moore and his crew wanted their jobs, so they refused Sam Houston when he wanted to sell the boats. Reluctantly, Houston gave in and decided to keep the Navy. Just another expense that the $8 million in debt Texas just couldn't afford. During Houston's first term, he tried to create good relations between Texas and its mother country of Mexico. Lamar would ruin this with his Santa Fe expedition, and Mexico would notice. President Santa Ana was eager to reinvade Texas and get revenge on the rebels there. So in March of 1842, he ordered for an invasion of southern Texas, taking multiple cities and going as far north as San Antonio. The Mexican army seemed to be trying to reclaim lost land from Texas, but this wouldn't stop Houston from reacting. Fearing that an attack on the Texan capital of Austin was imminent, Sam decided that it was due time to move the archives of Texas. All the history of the fledgling Texas nation was kept in Austin, including the Declaration of Independence as well as the Texan Constitution. Houston sent the Texan Rangers to evacuate these prized papers. No one cared enough to notify the citizens of Austin though, who promptly shot at what they thought to be traitors. Not wanting to escalate the situation, the Rangers ran away from the Austin citizens who ended up keeping the archives of Texas. The Mexican army that had invaded southern Texas was still on the loose and needed to be dealt with promptly. 220 Texan Rangers were sent out to deal with this. Being outnumbered by the Mexican army seven times over was a scary prospect. This prospect was made even scarier when a band of 200 Cherokee warriors joined the now reinforced Mexican army. The Mexicans held a fortified position in a nearby town, and obviously held the advantage. It was time for some Texan trickery to be orchestrated for a decisive victory. John Coffee Hayes was chosen to lure the Mexican army into an ambush where the 200 Texan rangers waited. John Coffee Hayes was given 37 men for this task, which he succeeded in. The Mexican army was caught off guard, and the rout would begin. The running Mexican army would take 60 casualties as the rangers would only see the death of one man, with only 9 being wounded. 
The Battle of Slaughter Creek would be the final and most decisive Texan victory of this newly ignited Texican-Mexican War. But the Texans weren't done, as Sam Houston ordered for the Mir expedition to kick out the remaining Mexican soldiers from southern Texas. The expedition was successful, considering the fact that they found no evidence of Mexican soldiers in Texan lands. This would not do for the Rangers, who now planned to return home with no heroic story to tell. That wouldn't do. No, no. They needed a story. So they crossed the Rio Grande River and set off to fight the Mexican army. Overconfidence is the death of many military expeditions, and this one would be no different. A battle would ensue that would see the outnumbered rangers fight bravely until they became hungry and thirsty from a day's worth of battling. The Texans decided to surrender. President Santa Ana then ordered for the execution of the Texans, but a compromise would be made and only one-tenth of the Texan soldiers would be executed. This was decimation to the definition, and the tenth man in every group was picked by a black bean. The 176 Texans were blindfolded and presented with a jar full of supposedly black and white beans. White beans meant life, and black beans, well, that was death. 17 Texans drew black beans and were executed, many of them being high-ranking officers, suggesting foul play. The rest of the 159 soldiers were sent to a prison in Mexico City, most likely joining their Santa Fe expedition brethren. The ultimate goal of Sam Houston's second term would be for protection from Mexico by joining with the United States. Their current president was a man named John Tyler, who considered the Texas annexation as his administrative priority. In April of 1844, a few months before the end of Houston and Tyler's presidencies, an official annexation treaty would be signed. It looked like his mission of annexation was complete, until four months later in June, where the U.S. Congress rejected the prospect of annexation due to Texas being a slave state. The life goal of Sam Houston was very nearly in grasp. Surely, Texas would become a state soon. A land-hungry candidate that wanted Texas to be annexed ran and won the 1844 American presidential election. His name was James K. Polk. The 1844 Texan presidential election would also take place. And the successors of Houston wouldn't kill themselves this time, as the fourth president of Texas, Anson Joan, would move from his position of Secretary of State to President on December 9th of 1844. Houston would end his term with Texas being $12 million in debt, but this is a decrease from the rate of debt that had been incurred under Lamar. 